title is The Magical Eye Learning to See More. Early Memories, Learning to See. I need to preface the following story with an explanation. Up to about age 19, my learning prominently focused on verbal, numerical information essential for a German high school diploma. We did have an art course, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, but the time allotted to it was minimal. Thus, in my teens, um, when I was told by an art teacher to look at a tree to study it, I vividly remember that I stared at the tree. I recognized, of course, that it was a tree, but I had no access then to the visual experience of overlapping branches, the resulting negative areas, or the wonderful progression from heavy to light branches all the way up to the tiniest twig. The same was true at the beginning of my professional education. I was asked to do a poster for the Rathaus in Basel, Switzerland. I sat in the courtyard of the building, unable to come up with any visual idea that could represent the building. I simply saw the entire red building a whole range of windows, doors, a clock. Then, obviously, my brain still didn't have the tools to see. My visual knowledge was not sufficiently developed, though I did end up with a simple poster design. But I learned that the ability to see more than the minimum amount we need to get around has to be trained, developed. My eyes finally did get trained through an excellent education in Basel, Switzerland. Through my teaching, I noticed so much more around me and frequently observe how my eyes get drawn to something which is visually interesting and beautiful without me having looked for it. It might be a single object or an entire scene, even a composition. The potential of the human eye is astonishing, maybe magical, and it is important for designers, students in any field of the arts, and for that matter, everyone to develop more of this wonderful potential. The benefits are well worth it. Learning about form, color, composition, theoretically through reading or lectures in the early stage of a design education is not helpful. To give the brain lasting visual impressions Students need to work intensely, practically, with form, as color, value, contrast, rhythm, shape, figure ground relationships. They need to solve meaningful basic design assignments, assignments that are visually challenging and have a clear goal. Only then, will students have the tools to see in any of these terms, which means to truly see, to see more than nouns, to see abstractly. I would like to include here a statement by Peter Schieldahl, the art critic of The New Yorker, that he made in a recent review on the renovation of the Yale University Art Gallery. He wrote that he ponders the way that study 
the mainspring of universities, burdens looking the playground of art. In developing assignments that might help students to see, it is important to set limitations, focus on a few important goals. One such assignment might involve composition studies that use only a few lines or shapes, a square, circle, triangle. The visual acuity needed to develop a coherent composition is more challenging than most realize. The eye must be intensely aware of the entire format. Notice how changes in the placement, size, or angle of individual shapes, lines, influence other shapes as well as the ground. The eye has to learn to see in relationships, since all is interconnected. Making decisions is easier when the entire composition is seen from a distance by taping it on the wall and standing back so the eye has the entire composition in its field of vision. Again and again, the eye has to scan the composition. Does the ground recede or come forward? Does it read a steep sky or create its own shapes? How do these shapes influence existing ones? How do lines divide the ground? Is the entire format actively involved Is the co in the composition? Or are some areas left out? How does the eye move around in the composition? And so on. The same process applies if the elements are representational or not. It is sometimes helpful to turn a composition upside down to see it fresh or place several stages of a composition side by side to allow for comparison. Did the composition improve or not? Which part is the weakest? what should be taken out and envisioned in another way. It might take hours or days of such intense observation until the composition holds convincingly together. But what a great <coughs> learning experience. After an intense composition, for example, of, in, of lines, the eye might be tuned in that it suddenly notices <coughs> line events in the environment. Here, the fan-like arrangement of needles on a pine branch invites the eye to envision 
a similar abstract composition. Individual lines rhythmically dividing the fan-like ground, contrasting with clusters of lines varying in texture and density. To solve any graphic design problem, even though the initial idea might be verbal, students have to come up with a form language suitable to represent the idea. Only a clear form language can lead to a coherent design solution. Let's look at a few examples. Reflections on a water surface consist of ever-changing fluid forms and a strong contrast between light and dark. This illustration of William Nicholson from a children's book around 1900 uh, beautifully captures these formal qualities. Additionally, the size and placement of the duck in the square format and the resulting shapes of the ground are all carefully considered. The image is representational, but it is seen abstractly. The representations of trees by Steff Geisbühler are both absolutely clear in their form language, close to being beautiful abstract compositions, they still capture the typical quality of these trees. Being able to make the jump from an abstract composition to the recognition of a similar event in reality or becoming aware of an underlying abstract form language in something we see in the environment, that was the pine branch, for example, both are important steps in the process of learning to see. Going to museums, galleries, provides a great opportunity to practice seeing in terms of form. It is helpful to focus on one aspect of the general form language, such as the use of color or value changes in a painting, the quality of edges, the figure ground relationships, the range of color intensity, the rhythmic quality of a painting, and so on. Such conscious looking will make the entire experience way more interesting and valuable. Sometimes, after such intense looking, I, for example, see for a few hours with the eyes of the artist. Works of art that leave a strong imprint in your mind might influence your own work. <coughs> oh. There is something wrong in the sequence. Well, we have to skip it. Um, 
whoever saw the movie on Tuesday, uh, the beautiful woodcuts of Aristide Mayol, which I knew since my student days, influenced a poster design for the Museum of Antiquities in Basel. This photo montage by Ali Sitsky, you don't see it, uh, so impressed me that it stayed in my mind for many years. It influenced my design for a conference of the Yale Women's Forum titled Yale Celebrates Women's Achievements in Today's World, uh, which was a conference at Yale. Sketching is a helpful way to realize fleeting mental images. The sketching tool, as brush, pen, or pencil, might also shape the resulting forms. Here, brush sketches helped me to clarify an image for a poster design. This little sketch for a cover design, simulated here since the original sketch has been lost, evoked an absolutely clear image in my mind to guide me with the composition and studio photography. In this poster by Ernst Keller for a Swiss exhibit in Stockholm in 1924, the cal calligraphy pen as drawing tool not only creates a consistent form language in the translation of the bird, but also links the letter forms to the rest of the poster. The whole is a linoleum cut. Now we make a big jump and go to color. Learning to see color, or better, being able to distinguish between the different dimensions of color is a demanding task and excellent eye training. The dimensions of color include the hue of a color, red, blue, yellow, The intensity of a color, here the bluest blue is the most intense of the blues, and the equivalent gray value or weight of a color. Here is the entire Mansell diagram, which visualizes the three dimensions of color. A grayscale-like rod stands in the center of this color sphere. Black is at the bottom, white at the top. Wings extend from this rod, one for each color. The individual strips within the wing of each color are connected to the grayscale according to their gray value. A darker blue, for example, with more black added, will sit towards the bottom. A lighter blue with white added will sit closer to the top. The most intense version of each color, strip, is the one furthest away from the grayscale. The difference in the length of the strips indicates how many steps from gray to the most intense version of that color the eye can distinguish. The yellow strip, therefore, reaches out far more than the blue strip. 
Uh, here are some example of, uh, examples of student exercises. Students were asked to visually match a gray to the value of five randomly chosen colors, disregarding intensity. This sounds easy, but is in fact a very hard task especially with bright colors. To make it a very physical experience, students were asked to mix the different grays by hand and paint swatches using brush and gouache paint. Many such swatches had to be compared to each color again and again deciding if the gray was lighter or darker until an equivalent gray value with each color was achieved. So the row of gray squares should read as a correct interpretation of the values of the five colors. By the way, by the way it is not, these are student exercises and there are some flaws in it. but it doesn't take away from the value of the exercise. By placing the gray, the gray values, so they touch the individual colors, that's the third row of the original set, makes it easier to judge if the interpretation is correct. And that's where you might notice problems. The light gray with the yellow on the left is too light. But the next color, the tan with the darker gray, is perfect. So they vary in their quality. To avoid any additional issues of changing gray values, a gray matched to the value of one of the five colors was added in increasing amounts until a progression of equal steps was achieved. And that is the band, the fourth element down, which again, the step to the gray is too big. They didn't quite make it. The endless testing and intense observation of variations in gray value or color intensity left students with a far greater learning experience than a study of the Mansell diagram alone could offer. This assignment, Joseph Albers, um, he was a teacher at the Bauhaus but later came to the United States and taught at Yale and Black Mountain College. And his publication, The Interaction of Color, might well be in your library here if you're a student. This assignment also focuses on the ability of the eye to distinguish between lighter and darker colors. Look at these pairs of color rectangles and decide which rectangle is lighter or darker in each of these pairs. Your turn. You will become aware how difficult it is. So give it a try. Make sure you judge gray value, not intensity. A helpful hint, try and stare at the edge between two colors. Really pick two colors and stare at the edge and wait a bit. And you might be able to decide a lighter after image on one of the two colors indicates that the other is darker, but you will see much more than that.
So you might, if you have uh, the interaction of color in the library, really use it. It's absolute wonderful eye training. These two images, also from the Albers portfolio, Interaction of Color, show clearly how relative color is. The same color on a lighter ground appears darker, and on a darker ground, lighter. Additionally, this student found a color relationship between ground and figure on both sides, so that the figures additionally appear to have the same color as the opposite ground. Our eyes can surely surprise us, fool us, if that's not magical. Letter form design. Letter form design also has a few cases of such optical illusions. A geometric circle does not appear visually as a circle, but seems narrower at the right and left side and heavier at the top and bottom. There is something very wrong. It is totally distorted. What do we do now? <laughs> well, I just keep going. So you can't see a thing. You can't touch. Here, a geometric circle is placed next to a Futura O. I would like you to decide which is the Futura O. It's all a little bit distorted. I don't know why. The left is the Futura. So even in the typeface Futura, a face that prided itself to rely purely on geometry, the O had to be optically corrected to appear as a circle. Looking at the O in Gil Sands, Futura, and Helvetica invites interesting comparisons. Gil Sands is on the left, Futura in the middle, and Helvetica on the right. You notice the difference? So both Gil Sands and Futura are close to the circular O. Gil Sanz is a little bit extended, and Helvetica has a strong vertical axis. <coughs> the letter, the crossbar of the H sits on the left in the measured middle, on the right in the optical middle, which means slightly higher. Turning the Helvetica H upside down on the right looks totally crazy, way too low. It is fun to observe all the upside-down H's on highway hospital signs and on your license plates. <laughs> A good way to train the eye as well as fine-tune visual memory is to observe existing typefaces and try to remember typical characteristics. I use the same word here to help with comparison. 
The original Helvetica is at the top. The new Helvetica below. Ariel, another version of Helvetica, further down. Then Futura, and the last one is Gil Sanz. The comparison shows how amazingly calligraphic Gil Sanz is. Comparing the rest based on this one word, the new Helvetica does not live up to the quality of the original one. The curved stroke on the R is too long. The crossbar of the T is too long and too thin. The roof of the A is too thin compared to the O. The curved stroke defining the bottom uh, counter space also is too thin. Both the vertical of the T as well as the vertical stroke on the right side of the A appear too heavy. Ariel is much better. Only the roof of the A seems to flip back. But looking at the Helvetica, on a train in Switzerland convinces me of the superior quality of Miedinger's design. He seems to have paid special attention to the beauty of the counterforms, and that carries the original Helvetica. Isn't it gorgeous on the train? The last exercise in teaching students to see focuses on letter spacing. These seemingly simple writing exercises with pencil on tracing paper ask students only to space the lines optically evenly apart. The exercise is usually done for about an hour. It is done in absolute silence with full concentration. To space lines equally, uh, optically equally apart means to control the area between lines, not the linear distance. This is quite hard for many students. Introducing curved lines on top of vertical and diagonal ones uh, makes it even harder since the shape of the negative area is now more varied. When this exercise is well done, as it is here, this page looks very beautiful. Here are some examples of type design by one of my students, which is based on a Greek inscription carved with a stylus-like tool into stone. And here, testing the typeface in a text situation, you can judge the very beautiful letter spacing. As a special present, I included here some exercises of optical letter spacing with a pen done by classmates of Adrian Frutiger, the designer of um, Universe and Frutiger, and Hans Edward Meyer, the designer of Syntax. One exercise book is supposed to be the one of Frutiger as a student. The brilliant teacher, Alfred Willimann, who taught calligraphy to both Frutiger and Hans Eduard Meyer, 
uh, you can see in each page of these exercises because he has a habit to show examples to the students. Can you see the very nice drawings and notation he gave the students on their exercise sheet? And the third and fourth line, including the numbers, are done by Alfred Willimann. <coughs> he is the most exquisite, or was, the most exquisite calligrapher. And another example, the fourth line is by Alfred Willimann. And here is a sample sheet of Ansche, which was written also by Willimann, which is, as you can see, very, very beautiful. And the last slide is a present to myself. It's an Egyptian horse, a relief of an Egyptian horse, which I saw in the new museum in Berlin the Egyptian collection, and it is so beautiful. So, if you like horses, enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the teaching ideas I mentioned go back to the Bauhaus, a school founded around 1920 in Weimar, Germany by Walter Gropius. It was Gropius who first instituted a course on the basics of art and design, which included form, color, and material. The first director of the course was Johannes Itten, famous for his teaching on color. Later, Moholy Nagy and Joseph Albers took on the directorship. Both Paul Klee and Kandinsky taught courses on basic form. Wouldn't you have liked to be in that course? <laughs> this introductory course was mandatory for all students and existed throughout the life of the Bauhaus. To quote Lea Dickerman, in her great article on the fundamentals of the teaching at the Bauhaus, in the catalog of the most recent exhibit on the Bauhaus at the Museum of Modern Art. I quote, experience, not knowledge, was the watchword at the Bauhaus. Joseph Albers, when he taught in the US, at Black Mountain College and Yale, changed this watchword to his own credo, to open students' eyes. And it is here where my teaching links. Thank you.